Kingdoms of Amalur Re-Reckoning is a perfectly average game, highlighted by several key moments that brought exceptional new ideas and stories to its world, yet all of this is overshadowed by an overbearing amount of filler content. So when most people think about Kingdoms of Amalur, the first thing that comes to mind are controversies about the MMO that never came to be, the legal debt with Rhode Island, and the larger-than-life story written by the creator of The Legend of Drist all of which only serve to distract players from the game that they're actually playing. Instead, I would argue that Amalur represents an open-world fable series experience much more than it represents any type of MMO gameplay. That might seem like a bit of an off-the-cuff approach to the game, but it was certainly an idea that I found would be reinforced time after time by the story, the art style, the combat, the boss designs, the map layouts, the character building, the stat system, the criminal system, the player housing. I think you get the point. And given the fact that Fable 3 had only released two years before Kingdoms of Amalur did, there's a very good chance that the Fable series was still fresh in the minds of the developers behind this game. Unfortunately, this isn't the through line that most players end up hearing as they approach Kingdoms of Amalur, since most games publications always hyped up the single player MMO aspects instead of the fantasy simulation aspects that are the real driving factors why I'm reminded of Fable. Even given these two perspectives on the game today, I can confidently say that Amalur is a shallow MMO-like experience, yet simultaneously a vast improvement on the Fable series in almost every single way, and that context certainly matters. On release, Kingdoms of Amalur was a financial failure, so much so that the developers at THQ not only failed to release the MMO this was supposed to be a prequel to, but literally had to dissolve the company in the process. Instead of going through every inch of backstory and history behind this weird and wacky development cycle, I'd instead like to tackle the game itself and see how well it holds up today. After all, we even got a remaster of the game in 2020 that fixed just as many problems as it made new ones at the same time. This re-reckoning for the game is less of a total overhaul and more of a low-key update to fix things like aspect ratios on modern computers and smaller details like camera control and level bracketing on each of the game zones. Suffice it to say, this re-release of the game with only very minor changes was yet another failure in the eyes of most players. And now that we're looking back at the re-release more than half a year after it first came out, things look equally questionable considering the big DLC update they had advertised still hasn't made its way to store shelves. This whole situation is like a gaming news journalist's wet dream, and yet it also represents a good motivation for me to rediscover a game I remember enjoying more than a decade ago. What I found waiting for me was surprising in ways that I wasn't expecting when I first opened it up. Namely, because of the fact that many of the design decisions that dominate the second half of the game are actually hard to get a very good perspective on unless you're going for a 100% style playthrough. Then there's the fact that I was literally running out of things to do by the time I hit 50 hours of playtime, despite assurances from several gaming sites back in 2012 that this game might be a 200 hour journey for a dedicated player. And suddenly, I started to come to the conclusion that Kingdoms of Amalur is a game that is uniquely hamstrung by their own marketing, and the resulting journalism that framed this entry to the market in the worst light possible. So with most of the history behind the game out of the way, my name is JB Jeb, and I want to take you on a journey through the best and worst moments of this underrated gem of the RPG adventure genre, a Kingdoms of Amalur Re-Reckoning Critique. 
before I really begin to dive into the mechanics, I have to recognize the fact that re-reckoning looks kind of weird. At first I thought the game was losing a couple of frames every second or so, or maybe something was going wrong with the remaster side of things to make the gameplay look sluggish. Instead, after around an hour of testing out different options, I realized that the game was running at a pretty consistent 60 frames per second. Sure, there were a couple of areas in the game that throw me down to like 20 frames per second for no good reason at all, but that was a rare thing over the entire playthrough. Instead, I was eventually able to realize that the running animation for my character just looks terrible. What's weird about this is that the running animation is the only animation in the entire game that I genuinely have a problem with, as it appears that the re-release will frequently cause this bug to happen where your character will randomly start to mess up their movement animations like they've suddenly developed a limp halfway through the game. Unfortunately, this is something that comes and goes so frequently that it's just kind of something you have to accept and move on with until the animation eventually fixes itself, maybe 15 minutes later or so. By the end of my time with Amler, I hardly even noticed that this was happening anymore as I eventually found myself getting used to it, but the strange problem remains one of the most detrimental factors in the overall visual side of things. Other than that, my time with the remaster was a remarkably bug-free experience without a single crash to desktop or any malfunctioning quests. Instead, I might see one or two visual bugs, such as camera angles not pointing in the right direction or characters facing the wrong way during a conversation, which I'm more or less okay with working around given the general state of AAA releases in the modern day. Unfortunately, this is just about the only good thing I can say about the re-release in general since it really doesn't change all that much. Re-Reckoning honestly looks like the original in almost every single way to me, which is probably due in large part to the visual style of the original. The same thing that keeps World of Warcraft looking somewhat passable nearly two decades after it first released is the cartoonish stylization of its world, and Kingdoms of Amalur certainly takes after that same ideal. Sure, there are moments throughout the game where I had to just stop and look around a bit because of a good set-piece design or a nice overlook, but I certainly wasn't staring at any individual trees in order to appreciate the texture of their bark. The thing is, I think this also lends itself to the type of story and world that the game is trying to create as the entire first half of the storyline tends to focus on a sort of Aesop's fable type of storytelling. As soon as you get out of the introductory area of the game, you are immediately thrown into Elwyn Forest or any other stereotypical fantasy forest biome. Things do eventually change their tone as you work your way through the burned down farmlands on the plains then make your way to the swampland battlefields, only to face off with the great evil in its crystalline fortress. But I don't think anyone is going to feel compelled to pick up the game for the value of its setting design alone. For most people, the greatest selling point for Kingdoms of Imler has to be the freeform combat system that allows you to combine the abilities of might, finesse, and sorcery into a single playstyle however you see fit. Each time you level up over the course of your journey, you will earn 3 points to distribute into the ability trees between melee, ranged, and spell-based combat power. This can take the form of active abilities like the shock spell that throws out the equivalent to an electric magic missile. Later, you can invest further points into the ability line to add passive effects to the ability like increasing the damage caused by the shock spell give it the ability to hit enemies in a small AoE, and add a small stun chance to the damage. Eventually, you can even turn it into a charge spell that allows you to form an entire thundercloud in the room to cause high damage to everyone around the player. The only downside to this whole system is the fact that all the active damage abilities are based on a set damage amount for each ability level. For example, the level 1 Mark of Fire spell can do 60 damage per activation, while the level 5 Mark of Fire spell will do around 150 damage per activation. This ultimately makes active abilities pretty uniquely powerful during the early game, 
but then later causes them to drop off in effectiveness as you approach the late game monsters and item scaling continues while the abilities reach their peak long ago. This is a problem that can be worked around with some good itemization between the magical crit stat, elemental damage increases, and ability level increases on some of the rare items found around the world, but it's still something to keep in mind while building your character. The warrior playstyle is typically going to focus on the combat power of your weapons while using active abilities for their short duration buffs to yourself and debuffs for nearby enemies. The rogue ability tree is going to focus on bleed, poisons, traps, and stealth gameplay in order to fulfill your player fantasies of the assassination combat style, while the sorcerer ability tree is going to focus on elemental damage spells along with a couple of defensive tricks like a skeleton summoning spell, a self heal, and a damage mitigation bubble. Right there you've already got a pretty interesting choice between the three classes in their base form, but I think the game really starts to excel once you start mixing and matching the abilities up between multiple classes at the same time. After all, your warrior based character might not have the mana regeneration you might want if you were focusing on elemental spells, but you can almost always benefit from the skeletal summoning spell or a defensive bubble. Likewise, the finesse ability tree has some decent poisoning and bleed effects that you can add to your weapons that benefit every playstyle, or how the warrior ability line has several improved health and armor passive upgrades that you can pick up to get just a little bit more tanky no matter your general ability focus. This is even further reinforced as an optional way to play the game by the destiny mechanic that will give your character passive bonuses that vary dependent on how you invest your points over time. Most of these bonuses are purely passive bonuses to things like physical damage or elemental damage, but some of the more interesting changes include the sorcerer style destinies that will change your dodge ability into a blink skill, and eventually even adding frost or poison damage to the blink as well, all of which comes together in order to make an interesting decision whether you want to invest heavily into a single tree in order to earn the cool late game active abilities like Meteor, or whether you want to spread out your ability points just a little bit more evenly in order to take advantage of more passive style abilities that benefit the mixed playstyle. Thankfully, even the balancing between these choices ends up working surprisingly well since I was able to beat the game on hard difficulty using a mixed character build just as easily as if I had been focusing on a single class in particular. Now, this brings up the question whether these varied gameplay approaches are viable because they all have a similar power curve, or because the gameplay is easy enough that you don't really have to min-max anything in order to make your way through each encounter. The defining factor that I think leans the game towards the easy difficulty side of things is the fact that you can use health potions at any time, without any cooldown, and without any related animations. Meaning that as long as you have a healthy amount of potions on hand, you could theoretically chug your way through any encounter in the game while mitigating the risk of death almost entirely. As such, the only time I found myself really dying in the game was a particular boss encounter where I was definitely underleveled and everything could practically one-shot me unless I was already at full health when the projectile hit me. This was a scenario I was obviously not supposed to be doing at that point in time, but that doesn't necessarily make the combat system difficult. Eventually, I was able to learn the fight well enough that I could dodge every single mega projectile, as well as all the adds, while popping health potions in between to give myself some breathing room, but the end result didn't feel like I had really learned anything from the encounter, or even really improved as a player. Victory wasn't a case of me overcoming a hard mechanical challenge, but instead was a test of patience and preparedness, depending on how many health potions I was willing to invest into the encounter, a factor of difficulty that I believe is almost entirely defined by the stagger mechanics in this game. Most of the base enemies in the game will suffer from a stagger animation every single time you hit them, interrupting their attack and stopping them from moving long enough for the next hit in a weapon combo to likely also hit them. 
As such, in a one-on-one -on -one fight against most enemies in the game, the player character is just going to absolutely wreck their opponents. Now, obviously, this isn't going to be challenging when it comes to the boss encounters in the game, so they added a type of stagger resistance to enemies with purple nameplates that will force players to consistently be damaging an enemy for several combos before you can really start to stagger them and do big damage. Admittedly, this still made a lot of my fights against boss characters result in me pushing them into a corner, then repeatedly stunlocking them to death with attack combos. So far so easy, except that all the enemies in the game have the exact same ability to stagger your character on every hit. In some ways, I think this was meant to be a response to the player's ability to stagger lock a single mob, since any enemies that interrupt the cycle can force the player into a more interesting combat encounter. Unfortunately, this can also lead the player character into getting stunlocked into an almost never-ending flurry of enemy attacks when you're fighting off 10 to 15 enemies at once. Unlike the Assassin's Creed series, the enemies in Amler really want to kill you, and regardless of how many of them are in battle at any point in time, they will all be trying to hit you with their best efforts. Add to this the fact that almost every enemy type has at least one ranged attack, and suddenly these mass numbers battles can quickly get out of hand. This is such a defining part of the combat system that one of the most important effects from the difficulty options is a limit to the number of monsters that can attack you at any one point in time. This isn't a limit to the number of creatures in any given battle, but instead allows players to decrease the number of attacks these monsters actually use in tandem with each other. For example, on the easier difficulties when a troll tries to do his big overhead smash, it will probably lock out all the other mobs in the room from attacking at the same time, so that all you have to do is focus on dodging that one troll's attack. So while the difficulty options do include the normal boring stat buffs like increasing mob health and damage, this attack limiter facet for the difficulty option actually does a lot of good for upping the ante in any given battle. The reason why this is so particularly important for the difficulty of the game is due to the fact that every single attack in the game is theoretically avoidable with the well-timed use of the dodge move. The timing on this move is actually surprisingly difficult to get used to since the dodge only moves the character out of the way without actually giving you any invulnerability frames. This is an important distinction since the vast majority of the attacks in the game will actually heat seek their way to the player's location up until the very last moment that it hits. This is even true for the multitude of melee attacks thrown in the player's direction, as the enemy simply rotates in position to match your character up until the very last moments of the swing. On a personal level, I thought this implementation of attack seeking was really frustrating regardless of whether it encouraged me to develop a better skill level in combat. Like, when I can see an attack coming, but the enemy shoots their projectile so slowly that I reacted too early with my dodge and still end up getting hit in the process. So one that also causes my character to stagger and interrupt the flow of combat, more than likely leaving me open to further attacks in the enemy combo, and I started to view the combat as more frustrating than it was fun. Sure, the animations on everything look pretty clean, but the player attacks are also so hard-coded to the point where you basically can't do anything else with a combo once you've committed to the attack. This might seem minor when you're using quicker weapons like the dagger set, but the last part of the chakram combo takes a full second from the point where the weapon leaves your hands and then returns to the player, finally giving you control again. So, when you choose one of the heavier style weapons like the greatsword or the hammer, you're going to get pretty good damage numbers out of them, although this does come at the expense of the player's ability to dodge roll at any point in time, once you're locked into the combo. Between these two factors of stagger mechanics and locked-in animations, the combat is left feeling very methodical and 
heavy. So if you're fighting off an encounter where you need to stay agile, I found myself only using the first 3 hits from the chakra combo in order to keep my options for dodge rolls open at nearly every point in the battle. Or if you're looking to get in some heavy damage in the last minute or possibly trigger a stagger, you can always commit to the 4th hit in the chakra combo when you feel like it's safe to leave yourself open to enemy attack. I think the moment to moment strategy decisions around how much you want to commit to a heavy attack or not are interesting, but a lack of any consistent telegraphing for the combat system makes it a lot harder for me to get invested into the minutia of it all. Some attacks can be blocked, some attacks can be parried, and others simply can't. Some attacks move the enemy less than a foot from their starting position, while other attacks make the character look like an Olympic fencing competition. Sure, I might be able to parry almost every attack in the game, but that doesn't make me feel like trying the move out all that often when the very first mini boss at the end of the tutorial teaches players that the block skill cannot save you from everything. Some attacks are simply a one and done, while other attacks will roll into combos if the enemy catches you with the first hit, while other attacks will combo even if you don't get hit at first. and. With all of these, the attacks obviously have heat seeking capabilities, so you can't dodge too early and you can't dodge too late, but instead you have to hit this weirdly specific sweet zone in the middle that might not even give you enough time to hit the enemy back depending on which combo they are using. Over time I ended up learning and understanding the movesets on all of these enemies, but that doesn't make me feel any better once I come to the conclusion that there are several attack combos that you just have to wait out for several seconds while the bear swipes at the empty air and there's really no way you can punish that enemy in between their attacks. And none of this is really communicated to the player until you get hit for the first time with each ability. If you want an example of how other games do this better, we can look at Sekiro, which uses a large red prompt along with an audio cue in order to tell a player when an unblockable attack is about to come in. Then Sekiro encourages the player to learn the nature of the attack and dodge through or over the enemy in order to take advantage of the small opening they leave for you neither of which are present in Kingdoms of Amalur, where you can stagger almost every enemy in the game except for these weird combos that somehow make the enemy invulnerable to stagger for as long as they're locked into the animation. This has the rudimentary features of a good action fighter, but they're just thrown together so haphazardly that the system as a whole buckles under the weight of inconsistent combat features a problem which ends up directly affecting the way that you build your characters. After all, there's only a single way in the entire game to mitigate the stagger mechanics on your character and it comes in the form of a 10 second buff halfway through the might tree. This ability doesn't seem all that impressive in the grand scheme of things, but when put into the combat system of Amalur, the option to ignore flinch mechanics just about breaks the game. Enter a boss room, activate your 10 second buff, then mash your attack button to complete the same weapon combos time after time while you just eat away at the enemy's health pool. If you're worried about getting hit by anyone, just chill out. This berserking ability also comes with a built in 25% lifesteal chance that will probably fill your bar up even higher than when you started the fight with. And if things ever really get dicey, you can just use a couple of your infinite capacity, zero animation, zero cooldown health potions, and you're basically just gonna be okay. Now, while each of the different classes has some unique abilities like the frenzy buff, the ability for rogues to use smoke bombs, and the fact that mages can call down a literal meteor, most of these abilities are going to be surprisingly lackluster. Take for example the firebrand ability that allows you to first mark a group of enemies in an area, then hold down the ability button in order to make all of those marks explode at the same time for high fire damage. After investing 5 points into the ability, it will do 220 base damage to any enemies you use it on, which is pretty good when you first start off the game with most weapons doing between 10 to 40 damage per hit. 
Unfortunately, that type of damage output becomes a lot less valuable once you start seeing weapons with 120 damage per strike within the first 10 hours, and then most likely starting to find 200 plus damage per strike weapons near the 20 hour mark. Mind you, things aren't going all that much better for the Meteor spell that does a base 700 damage at max level. Sure that's a harder individual hit than I can do with even the late game weapons in Amalur, but that's also going to cost 280 mana along with a sizable cooldown that will keep the spell from really competing with the long rage chakrams that you can just spam all day, every day. You can certainly make spells work surprisingly well by stacking a bunch of elemental damage buffs on your armor along with a full set of mage gear to beef up your mana regeneration, but that's always going to be a much more expensive investment than it takes to just pick up a randomly generated weapon with really good damage stats. So while there is some depth to be found in the game's ability design, the item stats which most builds rely on will consistently undermine any sense of depth for character customization. I think that this is best seen when it comes to the fact that you can make your character invulnerable fairly early into the game if you put in the effort. This is accomplished by taking advantage of the stat called Damage Resistance in Kingdoms of Amalur which simply reduces any damage that you take by a set percentage. To make this even worse, the stat is additive as well, meaning that you can conceivably build your way up to 100% damage resistance by simply stacking every piece of gear with damage reduction on it. And of course, with a little bit of know-how about the loot options, it's relatively easy to get this gear within the first 10 to 15 hours of a new game. First there's a 5% DR ring in one of the dungeons in the first world zone, a 13% DR amulet for sale in the capital city of Isa, a craftable 10% DR gem that you can make by the time you're level 10, a 20% DR shield for sale in the capital city of Rathir, and several item components for 5-7% to DR that you can put into any craftable gear that you want to make. Then as you progress further through the world you can even pick up a 5% DR by completing the arena faction story or a 12% damage reduction by investing into the jack of all trades destiny line, a 5% DR for completing the main storyline, and a late game ring that gives the player 20% DR as well as a late game amulet that can give you 25% DR. All of which means that you could theoretically pump up your damage resistance stat to 133% mitigation by the end of your journey, even though you are functionally invulnerable by the time you hit 100%. But what's really funny about this is that even if you don't put in the effort to build up that 100% DR, there's still a good chance that you'll end up close to that number anyways, simply based on how common physical and elemental resistance gear drops throughout the game. So even when I messed up the build halfway through the campaign and salvaged my 20% DR shield by pure mistake, I could still ignore almost every attack in the game simply due to the varied levels of physical resistance on all my other gear pieces. The unfortunate part of this is the fact that this undermined almost the entirety of the stat system from my perspective. So when I salvaged my way through every single piece of gear that I picked up throughout the storyline, I would still struggle to develop a better piece of armor compared to what I could build at the 10 hour mark simply due to the sheer utility of this damage resistance stat. And that's a real shame because the rest of the gear stats like active regeneration, lifesteal, increased raw damage percentages, and several ways to increase your crit chance all seem like they could lead to a wide variety of interesting playstyles. But why would I want to bother with these alternate gear types when the easiest path to success is to just make yourself invulnerable? I think that there's the basic tools for a fun gear system to be found within this game, except that it's all undermined by the imbalance between each option to an insane degree. I already mentioned the crafting system in passing, but it's worth diving just a little bit deeper on the topic since it theoretically both benefits from and suffers under this wide variety of gear options. 
See, by using the salvage mechanic at any blacksmith station, you can break down your white, green, and blue gear into parts that can then be put back together to form the stat block on a crafted item. This does require the player to invest a certain amount of skill points each level into the blacksmithing skill in order to increase your options while using the mechanic, but it can obviously pay for itself with the capability of crafting all the damage resistance gear throughout the game. The bad part about all this is that since you can only salvage items of lower quality throughout the game, most of the really interesting stat blocks on purple items and set pieces can never be reduced into a usable format for crafters. As such, the vast majority of your choices between the building blocks for each item will be reduced to a comparison between a plus 10 increase to health versus a 5% increase to fire damage. Sure, that might be an interesting choice to make if you really care about building a character with super high health or a mage focused on fire damage, but for the rest of us, it's probably going to feel pretty neutral either way. So while the crafting system can end up building some absolutely broken items depending on your character build, the vast majority of the time it is going to involve a series of uninteresting choices that feel like a waste of time. Even when you happen to get a couple of items that you need to build a really good weapon slightly earlier than you would find similar things in the wild, you're always going to be taking parts of items that you already had and then rearranging them into a more efficient format. As such, you're never technically building any gear that's actually better than the greens and blues you found lying on the floor, but instead are taking the best parts and stats from each of those pieces of gear in order to make sure that you can put together exactly the piece that you want. Now, in a perfect world, this would allow the player to make a meaningful choice on how they want to progress through the gearing process. Either you would salvage every piece of gear that you come across, then put them back together in more targeted items for your build, or you might sell the gear that you come across, then use the gold from this process to buy the best things that you can find in each new city. But then we look at the fact that you can only salvage items up to blue quality or lower, and suddenly you have no option but to sell the purple and yellow items that don't fit your playstyle fully knowing that these items are going to be worth the most gold in the game even though they are useless to a crafter. Mind you, even though both playstyles are going to end up being forced into selling millions of gold worth of items, there's also a distinct lack of worthwhile items to spend all that money on. The vast majority of the time, by the point I actually reached a new merchant in the story, I already had far superior items than anything they could even hope of selling, most often already doubling the stats available on their wares. So what could have been an interesting choice between the two gearing paths throughout the game will quickly merge into a nearly identical experience simply due to all the restrictions on the actual usefulness of crafting. Once again, I'm looking back at a system that is almost a unique gameplay experience that Amler somehow found a way to homogenize into a downright bland path of least resistance. At this point, we have a single mechanic left to cover in the character building process, which lies in the skills system where you can invest a single point between several specialties each level. This includes all the boring stuff like learning how to craft alchemy potions while using more ingredients, learning how to create better gems, and selling items for a better percentage of gold. We also have some more interesting choices like the detect hidden skill, which will allow you to find hidden treasure chests, pass through hidden doors, and mark things like traps and collectibles on the map. Unfortunately, this single skill is a bit of an outlier in terms of actually interesting things that it does, since the rest of the skill tree focuses on making the lockpicking, dispelling, and stealth mechanics marginally easier to work through. Of course, this stuff comes with a series of perks like the ability to open easy locks automatically, or reducing the chance to curse yourself while dispelling, but it's all just so mundane that you've probably seen these same bonuses in half a dozen games before this point. 
but if this system is really important to your enjoyment of Amalur, there's yet another option to min-max the system as you find the random skill trainers throughout the world that can permanently increase your skill level by a single point if you pay them a couple thousand gold. This is yet again pennies in the grand scheme of things since there's almost nothing else worth buying in the game, so I would often find myself buying these skill training sessions out of a sheer lack of anything else to do with my gold. So when you add on the fact that you can use several random drops throughout the world, like skill books you find during your travels, and an increase of up to 3 skill points per skill if you follow the jack of all trades destiny type, and you can fairly easily increase every skill up to the max level of 10 by the end of the game. So what could have possibly been a character defining mechanic for the game that also made each playthrough feel different instead has yet again homogenized the experience so that everyone can do more or less everything if you put your mind to it. The thing is, with all of these different mechanics, it actually does feel like you're building a unique character throughout the early points of the campaign. When I started off building a magic focus caster with a focus in the detect hidden skill and crafting, it felt like a unique experience with a definite playstyle that I was building up over time. Unfortunately, Ambler also makes total class respects incredibly easy to access throughout the game due to the nature of your character's role in the story. So when you eventually get a little bored with your initial playstyle and start using the fate system to try out the other options, that's when the point might start to hit home that everything actually feels like the same beats, but with a different color. Every class eventually devolves into a combo attacker with several utility abilities that can help you out defensively. Every skill eventually ramps up to near max levels of proficiency, reducing any sense of interest in where you place your skill points. Every destiny ends up feeling like a series of passive buffs that do little to change your actual playstyle until the very last unlock in each tree. And while the combat system might look flashy and action based, it quickly devolves into a battle to see who can trigger more staggers that lock the enemy out of the fight for seconds at a time. It's fun until you break the systems then it's fun because you broke the systems, until it's no longer fun because you've just been repeating the same gameplay loop for another 25 hours of time. And once you hit this point of repetition for the actual game systems, I was eventually able to find the true draw behind the game which lies in its world building and lore. Over the course of a 50 hour journey, you'll have the chance to explore 7 different biomes, each split into 5 to 12 different thematic zones which often house their own standalone story arcs. Throughout your journey, you'll also have to fight your way through 25 different enemy types in the game, which each use a different combat style and skills to try and kill off the player character. If we're being generous, that base number of 25 enemy types might be doubled as we get into the second half of the storyline and they start giving the enemies a recolor, but for the most part, you're going to be fighting your way through the same enemies more than enough times to eventually lose interest in them by the 30 hour mark or so. Yet another case of a mechanic that is incredibly fun for the first half of the player experience, which eventually dissolves under the monotony of repetition over time. These are all really good enemy designs, like the sprites that are upgraded when they're in the presence of an elemental champion sprite that can give the lesser ones new powers like charge or ice shard and the way they put certain groups of enemies together to work with each other's strengths makes each new encounter interesting as you start to find both the Leon Shea and the Krudok commonly paired up to pepper you with ranged attacks as you struggle to keep up with their movement abilities. But then there's just not enough enemy diversity to keep throwing new combinations of combat encounters at the player, and I suddenly started to see the same fights play out time after time after time. If there was ever a reason why most critics for the game say that it goes on too long, I'd have to pin it on the lack of combat diversity since it eventually got so boring to me that I started ignoring most enemy packs when I had a chance to simply run past them. 
of the 25 enemy types in Amler, the only one that can reliably catch up with the player character is the wolf enemy type, and even then, if you dodge their attack at the right time, you've probably already run out of their aggro range before they even have a chance to follow up. So once you've had your fair share of fun with the combat system, you can basically avoid any encounters that aren't directly related to quest progression in front of a locked door or boss encounters. A fact that was definitely relieving to figure out halfway through my playthrough to full completion, but still confusing in terms of design due to the fact that the enemy placement practically holds no value in the vast majority of situations. Things aren't so bad as the random fields of evenly placed enemy characters like in your average MMO, but the random groups of enemies scattered throughout the open world are kind of just there to serve as filler. Random packs of unchallenging combat checks, protecting lackluster gear that do a better job of making the world feel populated than they do at providing an active player experience. I really do wish that I could look back at the actual combat mechanics for the game just a little bit more enthusiastically, but Amler even has a built-in super mode for the game that can basically allow you to take out any boss encounter in the game with minimal effort. And while this is still an objectively better combat system than the Fable series, the competitors were simply short enough to mitigate the chance of burnout over time. So despite the fact that there's only around 20 enemy types in Fable 3, which is certainly less than in Amalur, those enemy types are spread out over the course of a 20 hour journey instead of a 50 hour epic. And suddenly we're wrapping back around to the age old question for gaming critics that ask how long is too long for a video game. My answer to that question is that a game only starts to feel too long when it's run out of interesting new situations to place me into, and that's a problem that I certainly felt while working my way through 220 of the in-game quests. But I also have to acknowledge the fact that I chose to make that journey of my own free will. There was no one really asking me to play through the Amler remaster, and I could have just worked on a different project if I actually wanted to. Instead, there was something about the game that drew me in and gave me a purpose behind exploring my way through every forsaken corner of this RPG. And that would have to be the lore. I'm using the word lore in this discussion because I'm specifically talking about the world building and the general meta-analysis that comes up as a result of the storytelling, and not the actual stories themselves. See, while there are a fair couple of storylines that are relatively entertaining, I found that the vast majority of my enjoyment for the game lied in the consideration for what the many plotlines are trying to imply, rather than what they are actually conveying. Kingdoms of Ambler is like one giant analysis on the varied ways that fate might impact a world where everyone has their life path laid out in front of them. To set the stage, every single sentient creature in this world has a fate written into the fabric of the universe, which tells a specific type of fortune teller called a fate weaver exactly what they will accomplish in their lifetime, and eventually how they will die. For humans, this might be as simple as a farmer that will marry at the age of 23 and die by falling off a cliff at the age of 31. So while he might just accept that as an inevitability, there's a large number of people who try to resist fate by any means possible. Say that farmer builds a house in the middle of the plains that are perfectly flat for two miles in every direction, and he resolves to never leave this flat patch of ground for any reason, lest he risk the chance of finding any cliffs to fall off of. If he had simply lived a normal life, he would have probably met his fate while traveling down a cliffside road on the way to the market, but the world will always find a way around his resistance for the future. It might be a simple thing, like the man was working on the roofing of the farmhouse, then lost his footing, causing him to fall off the side of the building, which could be considered a man-made cliff. Or, in a moment of irony, a bandit leader named Cliff might decide to visit the farm to collect his dues, only to leave with the farmer's head. 
Whether the cliff takes the form of the expected or the outlandish, somehow the threads of fate always lead each story to the right conclusion over time. So instead of simply accepting that as a part of the world, Kingdoms of Amler goes a little bit further and starts to ask the question about how this might affect their society. In a universe where every action an individual will ever take is written into the scripture of fate, it brings to question whether there exists any true sense of free choice. If everything you have done and everything you will eventually do is already set in stone, are you actually making the choices that guide your life, or is it fate that guides you down your path? For if everything that will happen is already known, that implies that the choices made throughout a lifetime are never truly choices, but always a considered absolute. In the case of a hero of fate, this implies that their success in battle is never a function of the effort that they put in, but instead simply a written story in the telling. The ending was written first, and its main character will always end up reaching that end, regardless of whether they want to or not. It's simply a question of how fast the reader is willing to flip through the pages. Now, that's already a fascinating rule upon which to tell a story, but then the game adds in the player character to act as the cipher through which we'll be able to see things unfold. After dying for the first time, your avatar is the only creature to have been successfully resurrected by a gnomish science experiment called the Well of Souls. Now, that's a pretty big innovation in of itself, but then the player will quickly learn that in this process, you have been cut off from fate, and now exist without the bindings of the pre-written story that holds everyone else into this world lore. This is not only a fantastic mechanical excuse to allow the player to build their character up in any way they choose, between might, finesse, and sorcery, but also a fantastic narrative excuse to allow the player to respond to each situation as they see fit. Now that you no longer play by the rules of this world order set in the stone, the player avatar can also challenge and rewrite the story of the characters around them. Say we go back to the example of the farmer who awaits his death by cliffside, except that this time, the player recognized that the bandit leader is definitely an evil guy that deserves to be stopped. The difference between those two scenarios is the fact that the farmer could always resist fate, but never change it, while the player may now pluck the strands from his story and rewrite it in another's image. The farmer will no longer die by the hands of Cliff, and his fate immediately rewrites itself for a different ending. The player has not truly cut off the farmer from the threads of inevitability, but they have at least modified it to force the plotline into a different direction, and given the man a new story to be told. His new path through life will then go on to touch on the destinies of everyone he ends up interacting with, causing an entire ripple of butterfly effects to echo throughout the kingdom. Unfortunately, this kind of butterfly effect from the changes you can make in the fate system never seemed to manifest in-game that I was able to see, instead focusing on the minute details of the character-by-character -character stories. This focus on smaller scale narratives between only a handful of people at any one moment in time keeps things intimate so that you don't have to really think about the large scale impacts of any one action if you don't want to bother with the bigger picture. So while this meta destiny system is always technically present throughout the game, it only really rears its head at a few key decisions related to the faction storylines throughout Amalur. These factions that you progress through the ranks of are probably the best content in the entire game, not only based on their narrative value, but also the gameplay diversity they bring to the otherwise monotonous side quests. So when you're tackling the Thieves Guild quest line, its maze-like dungeons and patrolling humanoid monsters cater to a player that heavily invested in stealth contrasted against the arena quest line that focuses almost entirely on tight combat encounters with only the least bit of dialogue that is absolutely necessary to keep the story going. 
And for the other factions, the gameplay is tied to the thematic purpose of the faction, like the elemental mastery and discovery of the mages guild, or the mercenary defense against the demons from our past in the fighters guild. But what really struck me as the most interesting part of these faction quest lines is the underlying cycle behind them all. This is perhaps best seen in the House of Ballads, which will probably be the first faction that you meet in any given playthrough, and in many ways exists solely to introduce players to the next layer of the world's lore, the Fae. This slightly immortal race that is represented by the blue-skinned elves throughout the game are a bit like the manifestation of fate itself. They are only technically immortal because whenever a fey is killed, they return to the cycle to be reborn again in another shell, whether that be the form of a tree, a sprite, a troll, a bogger, or any other manner of magical monster or elf. What's interesting about this is the fact that many people assume that the Fae simply reincarnate as the same individual in order to repeat the cycle endlessly, but based on some dev diaries, it appears like each rendition of the same Fae over the millennia is actually being represented by a different spirit or body of energy. What may initially seem like they are inheriting the memories of the past self is merely the fact that each fey knows their fate from the moment that they are born into the world, fully aware of every step that they will take throughout their current existence. So while the humans and kobolds and Etten of this world might carve out their existence from the need to survive, the fey are each born with a task in mind from the very beginning. Every priest, librarian, and king in their society exists merely to serve in that role, and for no other reason. The humanoid fae are then broken down into the two courts between the Summer Kingdom of the West and the Winter Kingdom to the East. The Summer Fae embody courage, memory, and harmony, while the Winter Fae embody death, manipulation, and hatred. The rest of the more neutral-edged traits are then represented by the Wild Fae, like Mischief in the Boggarts, Change in the Sprites, and Pestilence in the case of the Crudoc. Given their lack of any true form of sentience, the story behind these creatures aren't really explored with any sense of depth, except for a single troll during the House of Ballads questline, which seems to display a desire to be a human instead of the Fae-like being that it already is. Unfortunately, the vast majority of this information is conveyed to the player through one of the most pretentious groups of quest givers I've ever met in a video game. On the one hand, that's perfectly in character for this group of fey who are purposely supposed to distance themselves from human sentiment since they look down on the mortal races as the agents of chaos. On the other hand, making these characters easy to hate is just about the last thing you would want while introducing the player to the Amalur lore. There's obviously some really good stuff here, but most players are just going to gloss over it all out of a pure lack of interest in the problems of an unempathetic group of characters. Unless... Unless maybe that was the writer's goal this entire time. Hear me out. We start off the House of Ballads by meeting their herald at the front steps, who tells you that mortals are not worthy to partake in the stories of the Fae. Supposedly, even the Fae have been having trouble with their LARPing recreations of the history for their race, and one of their heroes named Sagrel has mysteriously disappeared. Seemingly out of spite, the player character goes to the random cave Sagrel was supposed to dungeon delve through, until you make it to the final room where the normal story would have Sagrel fight off a single Thresh that's been terrorizing the area. This time, there are three Thresh waiting for the hero of the story, and we start to get a clue as to why the original player for the pantomime hadn't quite shown up to save the day. Returning back to the Herald, the Fae seems disturbed that a mere human was able to take up the mantle of their immortal Fae story, but he's even more concerned with the fact that something must have gone wrong with their telling in order to create three Threshings instead of only one. The conflict causes the House of Ballads to invite a mortal into their ranks for the first time in living memory, and they name you the new Sagrell. 
This sequence of events repeats itself a couple more times as you meet up with the original heroes of each story and help them surmount a series of challenges that have never really occurred before this point. The companion characters are consistently portrayed as naive to the true dangers of each combat encounter, which frequently leave these heroes of lore dead on the ground while you stand victorious. See, they had always been fated to succeed in the past, recreating the same stories time after time since the very origins of the world. As such, they had always been interacting with these stories like a rigged game where there was never a true risk of failure until there suddenly is. As a mere mortal, already accustomed to the risks of death and dismemberment, the player is better equipped to handle the successful outcomes of these events than the actual heroes that have been repeating their story for the last millennia. If only that was represented with a bit more mechanical fun, rather than making your way through several dungeons that feel practically the same as one another. Regardless, you eventually make your way to the questline where we find the troll that wanted to be a human, only to meet our nemesis for the questline in the Witch of Windermere. If that name sounds familiar at all, I have to point out the fact that a lot of the storytelling in Amalur is actually based off of the Celtic myths such as the Bargast, the Alfar, and the Tuatha which are more or less taken name for name from the old legends. However, in this rendition of the Witch of Windermere, she's more of a fairy godmother for the villains of the House of Ballads, granting the wishes for characters like the troll named Nyx to take fate into their own hands. We end up tracking her ability to change the fae legends down to a small monastery in the middle of the woods. There we find a corpse of one of the monks who had been digging the nearby well with his son when they found a mysterious type of crystal that seems to have otherworldly qualities. After exploring this dungeon, the player will find out that the son was actually the murderer all along, and something about this strange mineral called Prismere had warped his mind into a confused rage. Eventually, you're forced to kill the boy when he attacks you and take his magical whistle carved out of the mineral that supposedly allows you to match the tone of these hidden sources of Prismere. Mind you, even though this quest might seem slightly out of place compared to all the fate stuff, this is probably the best introduction in the game to the theory of Prismere and its strange qualities that bend the minds of any living creatures in the area. This is actually the cause of the larger conflict of the main story, as a strain of Prismere was first discovered deep in the territory of the Winter Elves, which tainted and enhanced their hatred for the mortal races that was already an inherent part of their fey design. Once again taking an important introduction of story elements, then throwing them into a storyline that players might not even end up finding if they don't explore this random corner of the first world zone. Sure, the main story vaguely introduces Prismere as something that exists under the Tuatha control early in the game, but it always felt implied like it was a super good material for armor and weapons instead of a hallucinogenic. But here we stand, just a little bit more knowledgeable to the world and ready to use this information against the Witch of Windermere in a final assault against her Castle of Thorns. This section leans heavily into the folklore genre of storytelling as you come to the first gate and find two of the prior heroes of ballads mind warped by the Prismere and now guarding the gates deeper into the forest. You have to challenge one of these knights for the right to take his place by the lady's side and slap a fedora's worth of fairy gear on your character before progressing further. Slightly later you come across an invisible bridge that can only come together if you can best the guardian of the bridge in mortal combat. The only problem is that he's already dead, so you drip feed him a potion of restoration, nurse him back to life, then brutally combo him in a corner of the waterfall until he's once again dead and you can now cross over the missing bridge when it comes back together. Your final test on the assault comes in the form of the actual village of Windermere, where the Witch of the Wilds has used her power of Prismere to convince the wandering trolls, sprites, and boggarts that they are in fact human and living a blissful life of peace. So after a little exploration, you come across the real hero, Sagrell, who you took up the name for at the beginning of this journey, and he willingly guides you along your path despite the fact that he cannot help while under the witch's spell. 
The player uses the whistle from down in the well to break the spell on this formerly peaceful hamlet, and then, and only then, can Sagro safely gift you the keys to a bell with enough power to topple even the protections of the Thorny Queen's castle. Upon this final charge, you free the king and release the remaining knights from their enchanted service to the witch as you make your way to the final antechamber. It's only at this point that the king pulls you to the side and confides in Sagrell that he cannot go on. For the past thousand years, every time he met the witch of Windermere in battle, he always approached the situation with the foreknowledge of victory, for that was always the fated outcome up until this weird change of events. So this immortal king, he who lived as a king among heroes, had always triumphed over the witch by offering to forgive her for her sins, only to stab her in the back when she finally embraced him. To think that the embodiment of the Fae ideals would stoop to treachery and guile in order to murder his only challenger has always struck me as cowardly. But to then realize that this tale had been told and retold a thousand times, with him constantly aware that he would break his word to murder the damsel, while the witch fell to the throes of betrayal without even the chance to guide her own hand in battle. Better yet, that the Fae would go on to revere this man for his crimes and congratulate him for the courage of his actions, acting like this was the normal equivalent to putting down a rabid dog. As beings of pure fate, built for their sole purpose in life, it must be easy to bask in the safety of your place in the world, but I think that we as humans tend to look at inevitability with a certain hint of despair. So here we're given our first major choice in the world of Amler, as the player is given an option whether to continue on your path and fulfill the story of the Fey King. As such, you might take his place as the hero of legend and reign in his stead. Or rather, you might just as well ally yourself with the Witch of Wendemere to place her on the throne in a haphazard bid to change fate. After suffering through a thousand wars and a thousand deaths at the hand of the treasonous king, does she not deserve to win at least once? Especially when compared to a man that was only comfortable standing up to the witch when he knew for certain that the winds of destiny blew at his back. Mechanically, the difference between each option is relatively small since it only really changes out which character is going to be standing in front of the throne at the House of Ballads at the end of this story, but thematically? This choice will probably matter much more to the moral expression of the player than the presence of any mechanical difference. Essentially, do you believe that the quote-unquote good side deserves to win because it's based upon the light and order? Or does the willingness to take control of one's own destiny matter more to the human sense of will that I think is present in a lot of us as normal people? To be able to forge your own path through life, albeit on a slightly darker path than the stories and legends of the ancient heroes. This is why the House of Ballads needs to establish the Fae as a distinctly unlikable group of characters in order to blur the lines between a clear story of good versus evil. In many ways, the witch has been forced into a villainous role by the threads of fate, just as much as the heroes of the story are meant to embody the values of Summer. So is the evil in her soul simply an inherent part of who she is as a person, or has it been cultivated by millennia of slavery to the system? At every point during the plotline, the heroes of this tale refer to the witch as a malevolent planner who attempts to trick and deceive at every point. But is that a part of the stories that were written out for her, or simply an attempt to break free from the never-ending prison of death, rebirth, and constant unforgiving failure? The cycle never ended until she used the tools to make her own fate, however painful that might have been to her oppressors. Unfortunately, the larger context of this questline is mired in what I can only describe as a fantasy-based writing style. Sure, there are some really cool philosophical questions on offer to ask the player what is right and what is not, but the vast majority of those questions require you to take a step back and really think about things outside of the present context. 
during the actual gameplay, we're still killing the same Threshlings, Boggarts, and Trolls over and over as some random herald in the House of Ballads points you in the right direction. Likewise, even if you do develop a sense of pity for the Witch of Windermere relatively early in the storyline, it's not like the game is going to let you even agree or side with her until the very last moment in the story. Instead, the game kind of forces the player into asking for a fight at the last second, even if you as a player want to help out this poor soul. Mind you, this is not the fault of the dialogue wheel, since we've seen many examples of some really good character options even while using dialogue wheels in the past. Instead, I can only blame the lack of real choice at nearly every point in the game on underfunding. And let's be honest, I can't call the writing in the game fundamentally bad, since the underlying questions behind the game is actually one of its most shining features. But the way that they try to convey those large-scale stories always seems to get mired down by the quality of its quest design. You go somewhere, run past a bunch of enemies, kill the boss enemy, then take the secret entrance that immediately loops you back to the beginning of the cave like a perfect cycle. This is such boring content that it ironically gives me the vast amount of time I might want to take simply thinking about the context of what I'm doing. But when we actually get to the character conversations themselves, the vast majority of the interactions you make throughout the game seem to be with people that have resigned themselves to their fates long ago, and developed staunch defensive mechanisms to deal with the fact that they're probably going to fail at their life goal at one point or another. As such, the quest givers in most situations tend to be fairly one-dimensional, since they're almost entirely defined by the base desire for whatever they want at the current moment. Go kill this mining family so that I can take their land. Go do my chores for me so that I don't have to talk with the diplomats. Go steal this item of incredible wealth so that we can sell it and not starve. Too rarely does it go any deeper into the actual philosophy or reason behind their actions because in most cases there has never even been the chance for free action until the Fateless One was created at the very beginning of this game. It brings to mind the argument that if a god were to know everything that has happened and everything that will happen in the future, it undermines the capability for sentient creatures to have any free will of their own. In that circumstance, they might feel as though they were capable of thinking for themselves and deciding on a path throughout life, but the very notion that everything they will eventually do is already set in stone makes that free thinking process seem like little more than an illusion. Of course, if topics like that aren't really to your liking, then you don't have to worry about it too much since the game itself is never going to reference anything even half as interesting as that mind experiment I just brought up. Instead, this all just kind of fades into the background as an ever-present face of the Kingdom of Amler's world, yet only in a hidden sense like the strings behind the marionette. After all, if every character already has their book written out in front of them, there is very little need for them to even have a reason why they want what they want, except to fulfill their role as a part of the story. Ironically, this does create kind of an interesting meta-analysis into the nature of each book also being in a video game, where their stories work as a binary cycle between uncomplete quests turning into complete quests. And now I'm left in this really awkward situation where the value of the game's story is a result from my critical analysis of its themes instead of what is actually conveyed by the software. This is why people will typically tell you to play through Amler for the lore more than for any other reason because while the action and the storytelling might be passably average, it's really the subconscious theme analysis that either makes or breaks this game for most players. And that is something you very rarely find in almost any other type of game. Now, while most players will feel guided into the House of Ballads questline by the very fact that it takes place entirely within the first biome in the game, the next three factions are more spread out over the entire western continent. The first group you're likely to meet is called the Warsworn, and could be loosely considered the Fighters Guild of this universe. 
Once an ancient order of paladin-like heroes, they are now most often known for their mercenary behavior as they take on any manner of tasks in exchange for gold. As such, you will most likely be picking up your quests throughout the faction from the many defensive keeps that they man throughout the western landmass. Surprisingly, this does a really good job of establishing the Warsworn as an organized military force compared to basically everyone else in the area, since they're the only group that has a real barracks-like setting that you'll find in this world. Unfortunately, they also control most of the notice board quests for the game due to their nature as the mercenary faction in the world, so I ended up associating most of the more filler-based quests with the Warsworn as a result of their quest boards. Regardless, the Warsworn faction eventually end up introducing more of a future conflict than anything else with the presence of the Niskaru, which basically exists as this world's version of Chaos Demons. These otherworldly beings are drawn into Amalur by powerful sorcerers due to their strong hunger for sources of magic. Unfortunately, most things in the world of Amalur have at least some form of magic, so if the sorcerer who brought them here fails to bind the creatures with enough wards, they have a tendency to just start killing everything. Divided between the lesser Nisgaru and their larger Nisgaru lords, they represent an interesting artistic and mechanical difference from the normal creatures of this world, and suddenly it's your job to stop them. Over the course of the rest of the faction quest, we track down a traitor from within the ranks that's been helping a strange group of cultists steal objects of power from within their vaults. It's only through tracking down the movements of this cultist group that the player is introduced to the true history of the Warsworn that has been worn out of the general memory over time. Supposedly, this ancient order had first been created by a great warrior who saved the world from a Niskaru threat. Eamon the Great discovered a great cabal of magicians who were trying to raise the Niskaru lord named Kamazandru, a being so great that he could almost single-handedly send the world into an era of destruction simply by entering our reality. So now, a thousand years into the future, this strange cult has decided to try and repeat the events of the past, as they once again try to conjure the greater Niskaru into existence. The actual set piece for the event is pretty cool as you scale one of the greatest mountains in the desert area and destroy a series of fleshy towers that form the crown of Kamazandu. In action, this is as simple as equipping the Hammer of Eamon the Great since we had to reforge it halfway through the plotline specifically for this purpose, but just the idea that the very tips of his crown are still big enough to form these otherwise giant towers in the ground is a pretty cool way of indicating the size of this true threat. Regardless, as we finally make our way to the final cultist leader that set all of these events in motion, he of course has some grand plan to try and rule side by side with this demon the size of the Empire State Building, which we promptly stamp out of existence. But then at the very last minute, we're actually contacted by Kamazandu himself, who extends an offer to let you become his servant of chaos. An instrument of such power that the cultist leader was not even able to comprehend, which will lead the player into calling the remaining Warsworn leadership if you accept this charge. Otherwise, with the Niskaru threat once again under control, the player may return to Eamon's final resting place in order to become a true sworn. It might be a minor thing, but the fact that this faction uses an ulterior rank to commend the player character instead of simply calling you the new guildmaster is kind of a breath of fresh air. So instead of randomly becoming the bureaucratic leader of a mercenary battalion, you instead become a sort of champion-like character who will serve as the theoretical figurehead among their ranks. Still free to continue with any other mundane tasks you might have in your quest log without the weird narrative dissonance from your new role in the faction. Otherwise, the faction questline felt like more of a setup for the backstory of a much larger conflict that may have been yet to come if the series had ever continued farther than just a single game. After all, can you think of a more world-ending threat than an ancient god that whispers into the mind of manipulatable young souls and would be so large that he fills up your entire skybox? That's definitely never gone wrong for any MMOs in the past, so 
I can see why this otherworldly threat would be slightly set up in this way, but never truly vanquished due to the sheer nature of his power. Perhaps even more interesting is the fact that Kamazandu is voiced by Simon Templeman, who is best known for his work as Loghain during Dragon Age Origins, as well as the Legacy of Cain. All of this despite the fact that we only really get to talk with Kamazandu for around 60 seconds in total at the end of a long quest chain. Otherwise, Simon also did some work on a couple of Fae throughout the House of Ballads storyline, which only brings further questions to the nature of the Niskaru, since he gives Kamazandu a similar Scottish accent to the one that he uses while portraying the Fae. So with that in mind, are the Niskaru just another form of Fae in the world, given the fact that they have both examples of wildlife creatures as well as higher beings with true sentience? Maybe that's just a pipe dream that we'll never truly get the answer to since it seems really unlikely for the story to continue from this point, but the Niskaro as a whole do remain one of the most unexplored questions of this fantasy world in the grand scheme of things, especially when you take into account that they're supposed to be a more angelic style counterpart to the Niskaro that are vaguely mentioned in some old texts but never really seen in game. Amalur really wants you to feel like there's a wider world out there, ready to be discovered, and the Warsworn questline is only the beginning in terms of what awaits the wider narrative. If we instead wanted to look to the past for inspiration, the Scalia Arcana stands in for the Mages Guild and provides a mostly historical perspective for the conflict of their plotline. As one of the entry trials to the Scalia, the player must undergo a test that will pit any new aspirants against a threat that represents what they could do after the full growth of their magical powers. Similar to the fade walking sections of Dragon Age, this test is supposed to gauge the new member's ability to control themselves in the face of true power, but for unexplained reasons, something seems to go wrong with the test when we try to take it. Instead of facing off against some grand manifestation of our true power, we instead meet some random woman in the middle of a dream village who seems just as confused about everything as you are, until suddenly she seems to understand the situation and you are abruptly pulled out of your trial. The sage that was in charge of this starting chapter for the Scalia Arcana tells you that something in the dream let out a terrible energy feedback loop that killed the other mages that were observing the trial alongside him. Of course, since you're the only novice left alive for some reason, you'll have to go check up on a strange disturbance the sage felt from the nearby elemental conflux. In essence, this is going to be an elemental themed fire dungeon as you delve further into the depths and uncover another lesser mage that seems to be mind controlled by the entity that you first met in the dream world. In not too many worlds, she calls you a fool and basically thanks you for giving her the keys to her prison as you fight off her charge and restore the area to relative normalcy. The rest of the questline follows a similar line of events as you continue to track down this woman to another conflux of ice magic and then a conflux of thunder magic as the Scalia Arcana attempts to keep the elements in balance as this woman unlocks the power held in these ancient places. So when we reach the summit of yet another great mountain and the site of the Thunder Conduit, we end up meeting the first sage that inducted you into the society in what I can only assume was supposed to be a touching moment. Instead of allowing the woman to control his mind, our old mentor flings himself from the top of the mountain in an attempt to limit the threat his own body might pose while under the entity's control. Which would almost be a cool moment except that I don't even know enough about this character to remember his name. We talk for maybe two or three minutes tops during the introduction ceremony and while investigating the ice complex, but as far as developing an actual emotional connection to the character, no, not even close, at least not on my end. But what makes this all even worse is that we immediately follow him back to the bottom of the mountainside and find the body basically unhurt by the fall due to the sheer power of the woman that's in control of him. Cue a short boss fight where we once again have to fight her off and his heroic self-sacrifice was not only ineffective but also somewhat redundant as well since this wasn't even a particularly hard fight in the grand scheme of things.
If there's any emotion I should be feeling after a man throws himself off of a cliff, it shouldn't be resentment of the fact that the game forced me to backtrack through an entire dungeon in order to finally get to the open world and immediately fast travel to the crater he's left in the ground upon impact. That's not only a lack of emotional development for the character relationship, but a genuine pacing problem in the middle of an otherwise interesting story moment. It's only at this point, when we get an invitation to meet the Archmage in his basement laboratory, that we finally start to understand the full picture. As we're transported into another dream sequence, we delve into the mind of the nearly dead Guildmaster, and it seems like the Scalia Arcana was built for the sole purpose of locking away this magical entity known as Ciara Sidanus, the Dark Empyrean. Supposedly, she once ruled over the human race as a mage the likes of which would make the current Archmage of the Scalia Arcana look like an infant in the ways of magic. She was so strong that the entire world would bend their knee to her power until a haphazard group of three heroes were able to find their courage in her mistreatment of the people, a man, a gnome, and a woman. Together they were able to subdue the Dark Empyrean but not entirely defeat her, so instead she was imprisoned for all eternity under the watchful eye of the Arcana. Unfortunately, since the entry test of the guild requires a suitable challenge for the full potential of each new recruit, the magic went haywire when it encountered the player character with no fate to speak of. With no defined limit on what was supposed to be your intended fate, there was also no conceivable limit to the growth of your potential. So the spell simply sought out the most powerful magical entity to exist in this world to use as your trial, waking the Dark Empyrean from her millennial slumber. After completing her rituals in each of the elemental conflicts about the world, it's now only a matter of time until she can return to Amalur in her true physical form, ready to subjugate the even weaker humans of the modern day. Unless, of course, you and the Archmage can manage to bring her into this world a little bit before she's regained her full strength, and finally deal with the threat once and for all. The plotline wraps up surprisingly quickly as you summon her into the world in the courtyard of the Arcana University, then fight her off in one of the most mechanically interesting fights in the entire game. Congratulations, you've killed the nemesis of the Arcana and you're the new Archmage for the society due to the fact that you just undermined the only purpose the group had for an Archmage in the first place, as they used to be the primary wardens of this ancient threat. It's all fairly underwhelming in the execution of things, but the true interesting part here, as always, happens to be locked up behind the lore. By learning about Ciara Sidanus and the old history of the world, it indicates that things were once very different from how they are now. Humans used to be some of the most powerful magic users in the world, perhaps even more talented in general than even the immortal Fae. And yet this history never mentions any conflict between the humans and the Fae until fairly recently. If I want to go with a boring answer to that question, we could always just say that the Fae are creatures of fate, so if fate wasn't telling them to go to war with the humans, then there's no reason for them to budge from their millennial ennui. But if we wanted to theorize on some other alternative possibilities, it's interesting to think about if the human race might have once been Fae by nature. After all, no one is 100% certain on where the human race originated from, and the fact that the primal humans were much more magically attuned than in the modern day could also be explained by the idea that they had once been a certain type of fae. All of this is heightened by the fact that what little we do know about the origins of the human race is they were seen as the lesser servants to the Urathi, the angelic creatures that I mentioned before as the counterparts to the Niskaru. Whether these Urathi are fae by nature or not, the very placement of humans in their vicinity at the origin point for the mortal races indicates the presence of a much more interesting story to play out if the team behind Amler ever got a chance to expand upon all of this. But they never did. And now we're left with yet another dead end story that hints at something so much greater just below the surface. <laughs>
In circles and circles we go, chasing after the tale of a lore system that was obviously built up on the theory of growth over the next several years of games, and MMO updates that just never came. And between the three factions I already went into detail about, we can also see the grand presence of cycles in this world as a whole. The Warsworn legend was almost perfectly recreated step by step by the Niskaru cult and our fateless hero. The Scalia Arcana was practically doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past by its very nature as a permanent prison for the greatest mage to ever live, until of course you put that prisoner out of their misery. And then of course the House of Ballads was formed specifically for the repetition of fate and legend time after time, until you might either set them back on that path or break the circle completely. So too is it that the arena questline tells the story of a fae who got too complacent in their own victory until a mortal family stole the House of Valor out from under them long ago. So now that this human family has handed down ownership of the arena from generation to generation, it yet again falls upon our fateless one to repeat the cycle of things and wrest the House of Valor from complacency and corruption. In regards to the Traveler's Guild of Rogues and Thieves, it's said that they once founded their organization for the purposes of escaping the restrictions and order of our society, but now that the Travelers have slowly started to entrust their freedom to a religious figure that can tell the future, it now falls upon the Fateless One to decide their fate, whether they return to a life of risk and self-direction, or safety and structure. It seems unlikely to me that the strikingly circle-based storytelling throughout all of these plotlines is merely a coincidence. And sure, the cyclical nature of events is a little more tenuous in one faction compared to another, but undoubtedly they all call upon larger-than-life backstories to give their tonal direction a bit more of a sense of grandeur. To which there's a couple of different reasons why this peculiarity might have happened time after time. First, there's the chance that the writers behind Amler knew that they weren't going to be able to develop any sense of emotional weight behind the actual gameplay. Not once did I feel genuine connection to any of the characters throughout my 50 hours with this game, nor any pulls upon my feelings when the occasional death eventually happened. Yet, despite that fact, I can still look back at the theoretical backstory behind each of these individual factions, and all I can say is, wow. There is some top tier theory crafting bullshit they've come up with for this game, but then it never finds its way to actually create a relatable plot hook for me as an individual. So maybe, just maybe, something about the mechanical side of the game is holding things back. Maybe the directors knew that the character models weren't good at conveying emotions, so they tried to keep the storytelling really top level heavy. Maybe there was something budget related or time crunch sensitive that kept them from flushing out a sense of player control or choice in the narrative, but then again I could look at the same structural problems that are present in Dragon Age 2 and still acknowledge the downright jaw dropping character stories throughout that game despite the limitations of time and budget. A dialogue wheel does not intrinsically disconnect a player from the story, but a poorly used dialogue wheel disconnects the player from the story, and to be honest, every single line of dialogue in Amler is voice acted, which is pretty damn impressive considering the vast amount of RPGs that can't even put in that much effort. So no, I, I don't buy the first argument that we might blame all of this on the poor mechanical abilities behind Amler's storytelling for either time reasons or mechanical reasons. Second, there's the possibility that the main writers for the story are just inexperienced or bad, which seems just as unlikely to me. Kingdoms of Amler was not some tiny production that was struggling to make ends meet, considering the fact that they could afford to hire both R.A. Salvatore as well as the sheer amount of voiceover talent that they were able to put together. In addition to that, there are several side quests that hit all of the right emotional pulls except that these moments never seem to hit during the main questlines. 
Take for example the random quest outside the first Warsworn Keep, where we meet a traveling merchant who isn't exactly who he appears to be. After talking with him for a short while, you'll get to learn that he was actually a bandit who robbed the original alchemist, but after taking all of his stuff, the bandit decided to try one of the potions and see what happened. It turned out it was a potion of alchemical genius, so the bandit suddenly inherited all the knowledge of the former master and he decided to take over the previous business. Unfortunately, he didn't have the right ingredients to create another potion of alchemical skill, so he asked our hero to get him another potion so that he doesn't revert back into the unintelligent bandit. It's a quick, simple fetch task by its nature, but the ability for the writers to get me to care about this unimportant character within such a short period of time was something notable. Except that it never really went anywhere. It was a one and done quest that never managed to expand upon the idea to its logical conclusions. Does this bandit manage to set up a shop somewhere and find a consistent source for the ingredients that he needs? What happens on a day when he forgets to take the potion before it wears off? Would he eventually just natively learn his craft over time and no longer need the potion? Or maybe he eventually starts to become some sort of mutant as a result of the constant chemicals? So there's obviously enough of an initial spark for discussion behind the base idea, but then Imler seems like it fails to capture that spark with a longer term questline to really explore what might happen in this world. The thing is, there's several one-off quests that almost bring up a good idea, but then just kind of drop the reins as soon as you finish off the initial task. There's the time where you fight side by side with another scout as the two of you try to break down the enemy lines in a Tuatha controlled valley, but then you get to the other side and he kind of just thanks you for your help and you both continue on. So while I could have theoretically built up a relationship with either one of these characters, there was never enough time to do so considering the fact that both these stories might take 10 minutes at most if you really wanted to take your time with them. Unfortunately, I think this just encourages players to care less about any new characters they meet because the likelihood of them being just another one-off fetch quest is much more common than not, so why bother to learn about a character that you probably will never see again? But every once in a while, you actually do end up finding a long-term zone questline that has all the effort put in to explore the long-term effects of things. Take for example the Webwood area, where you come across a small village under attack by spiders which you promptly save from their apparent fate. The village elder then asks you to help save the leader of a passing military group who had gone into the nearby cave system to try and solve the spider threat. After entering the cave and saving the man, he tells you how it had been a trap and the spiders seem to be displaying a sense of tactics and strategy that should be beyond their intelligence. Alternatively, at this point you can also kill the mercenary leader before returning to the village, playing into the hands of a shady opportunist that wants to make some money off of all the extra webbing from the spider attacks. Instead, I chose to help this natural born leader who then told me to go to a nearby fey den that used to hold the immortal caretakers for this area of the forest. As we make our way through the dungeon, the player slowly finds a series of lore stones that recount the story of the Spider Queen who had always lived peacefully in the area until the humans started to enter her glen, cutting down trees for woods and stealing the very fabric of her children. Once you finally make it to her throne room, she taunts the player for being too late as she's been using the opportunity to attack the village while your back was turned. So by now we've already established the presence of several different factions within the village itself for you to side with, but also to establish a backstory for the villain that you might connect with as well. So of course you manage to save the village once again from the second spider attack, and now you head off to try and face off against the spider queen once and for all. This time she greets you at the beginning of the dungeon and asks for your help taking back her forest from the interlopers. Unfortunately, this would mean going back to murder everyone in the town, which doesn't sound like a very cash money thing to do, regardless of who the intruder is in the situation, so I refused her offer for help. But the important part is that there was an option in the first place. I was given control over my own character's direction and allowed to put just a little bit of self-direction into the story unlike nearly anywhere else in the game. 
I did end up making my way to the end of the dungeon and put the Spider Queen down despite her righteous crusade, simply because I personally thought that killing the innocent villagers wasn't the best way to handle the situation. And that's a choice I could only really make because I was invested in the village as a personality. I had met their elders and their shady merchants and their mercenary leaders and the young girl who wanted me to go check up whether her parents were alive in the next zone and the alchemist that needed some spider silk to make bandages which all came together to create at least the semblance of a community not worth killing for just some random reason. This was a good memorable series of events which downright proves that Amler can do things the right way if they really want to put in the effort. And the fact that they award the player a house in the area if you end up helping out the villagers really cements this place in my memory as a place I would always go home to whenever I needed to do chores later in the game. And yet, this is the exception when it comes to Amler's storytelling. There are a couple of other zone-wide quest chains, like when you build up a defensive force in the final act of the game, or when you slowly develop the Forgotten Keep in the middle of the swamps, but nothing quite as memorable to me as the initial Spider Queen questline. And certainly in no other place in the game did I encounter quite so many seemingly moral questions in order to proceed through even the faction questlines half of the time. But of course, the point of all this was to convince you that the actual writing skills of the Amalur team are there, just waiting to be found if you look in the right places. Instead, the third possible reason why I think the storylines in Amalur might have felt shallow character-wise is because they seem like they were built around their background introduction of lore that would only become useful much later on. In one way or another, almost every single faction ties into the main quest in a way that accentuates certain pieces of information that will only become useful along the path to the final boss. In the House of Ballads, it's pretty easy to see that it's set up as a lore dump, but when it comes to things like the House of Valor, it gets a bit more nuanced. Throughout the arena questline, we get to hear several rumors about how this place was once ruled by the Fae, who would demonstrate their courage through the blood-soaked sands of the Colosseum. So when a particularly violent human was not only able to join their ranks, but literally decimate his way through every single combatant in the faction, it establishes an example for why the Fae might have developed a hatred for the mortal races. At first they laughed at the thought of a human joining into their unending cycle, but eventually that dismissive nature quickly turned into absolute fear at the hands of a combatant who fought to live instead of lived to fight. Likewise, the Warsworn introduce the Nisgaru threat in a way that helps explain why a small band of creatures can usually be found at the magical ruins that we find several times along the main journey. The Scalia Arcana introduces both the history of the human race, but also the ancient power of the original humans that likely kept the mortal races from being immediately exterminated by the Winter Court of Fae. The Traveler's Guild ends up teaching players about the nearly religious power of Fate Weavers when they use their power to control instead of teach. And finally, the House of Sorrow that we'll eventually meet in the Eastern Swamps introduces the hierarchy and political conflict inherent to the Winter Fae. Individually, each of these things seem minor, but together they bring a deeper sense of understanding to the main plot than anything that you could have found yourself if you had just mainlined your way through the main story within 15 hours of play time. So if we assume the writers chose to create these factions in order to explain the New World Order instead of developing a purposeful story progression, then at least we have a logical rationale to explain why most of these quests have less first person depth than the Webwood questline. Realistically, it's probably some combination of all three factors that undermine the character development in Kingdoms of Amalur. But the part that's actually important about all of this is simply the fact that this problem exists in the first place. The drive which caused me to try and complete as many quests as possible in the game was always a personal sense of completionism and not a narrative or contextual purpose behind the grind like in other RPGs.
Instead, Ambler seems to be almost obsessed with the idea of the player character as an individual, perhaps because they are also the only character that has the chance to either succeed or fail based on their actions and the lack of a defined fate. So now that we have the full context from the factions already out of the way, it seems like I was bound to start talking about the main plotline eventually. We start out our story as a lifeless husk on the way to the incinerator, only to claw our way out from a pile of corpses in what I think has to be the worst textured cinematic that you can find in the entire game. Not really starting us off on the best foot, the rest of your time in the dungeon is a tutorial sequence to get players used to the three main combat styles before you've gotten out into the open world. Along the way, you meet up with the scientist that created the Well of Souls in the first place, who gives you your first task to find an old friend named Agarth, as he distracts the enemy Tuatha attacking the laboratory. Armed with a case of amnesia and a healthy curiosity for the world, you quickly find Agarth who will help guide you throughout the rest of our journey to reclaim our memories. Of course, since he's also a fate weaver, Agarth is most likely going to be most players' introduction to the idea of fate as an inevitability in this world, so the very moment that we learn about the core rule that this world uses as its base, it's also reviewed that we are the one outlier to the rule. Uncertain what to make of the whole situation, Agarth recommends that we go find another fate weaver in the area in order to try and figure out exactly what's happening with you. The new Fate Weaver's home is located on the other side of the first major zone in the game, conveniently nudging you into the direction of talking with several of the townspeople that you meet along the way. But let's say you make it through the temptation to get distracted by the numerous side quests available even just in this first area, and we suddenly learn that the Fate Weaver we were supposed to meet has been killed slightly before we arrived at the scene. Instead, we find a woman named Alan Shear, who tells you that a band of Tuatha have been tracking you ever since you escaped the Well of Souls, but she disappears before Agarth has a chance to catch up with us. Now that we've lost our chance to gain a second look at your fate from the dead Fate Weaver, Agarth decides that the next best thing is to take you to an abandoned ruin in order to pick up the Codex of Destiny, which was supposed to hold the fate of all things forever. Now, the only person who can actually read the Codex of Destiny are the oldest Fae to have ever lived, for it was the founders of this world that first created the Codex of Destiny in the first place and established the practice of fate weaving for all to follow. As such, we need to meet with the Fae King of the Summer Court in the Grand City of Yisa. Along the way, we can talk with a tree, do a random dungeon purge to help defend the forest, then unlock the gates to the city since the greatest threat in the area was apparently a small group of trolls corrupted by the Prismere. But you manage to get your audience with the King of Summer, alongside a suitably cryptic foretelling of what is yet to come. At the time, it kind of sounds like prattle, but looking back at it after finishing up the story, it will at least make a little more sense. Ultimately, the only thing this really does is set us onto the split path of the storyline, where one half revolves around tracking down the scientist that revived you, while the other half focuses on getting to the eastern continent. The first path is to track down the gnomish scientist named Fomerus Hughes, and ends up taking us to the southern barons as we track down his benefactor. After we catch up with this Templar named Octian, we manage to pull together some information and track down Hughes to a makeshift laboratory that he's been working out of since the escape. Quickly enough, a group of assassins follows your trail and suddenly the rest of the questline is a bit of a political game of cat and mouse as you travel to the city of Edessa and try to incriminate Octian for working with the Tuatha. At least, it sounds like it might have been a cool series of quests, but as soon as you confront Octian about the situation, he decides the best way to react to your lack of any evidence is to burn down the entire building and fight you off alongside an entire platoon of Tuatha warriors going up the scaffolding on one of the largest buildings in the city. So obviously, this is a little bit suspicious to the guards in the city and you're thanked for taking down a corrupt political figure then sent on your way. The plot doesn't really advance in any meaningful way as a result of this event and it's mostly just a chance to clear up some loose ends to the prologue sequence. 
Hughes thanks you for saving his life and basically calls you even at the end of the day, but then he just goes off to do more sciencey stuff with another group in the city and it feels like I never really did anything meaningful. Instead, we'll find the next couple steps for the story in the Northern Plains as we attempt to help Alan Shear recover a general to lead the human armies to victory. Apparently, the best choice we have available to us is a woman named Talera, who's always been fated to fail, yet never faltered in her pursuit of victory for the human race. See, while Talera was able to force both sides into a stalemate over the siege of Mel Shenshir, the shame that she could not outright win the day for her people was enough to make her look for an alternative solution to the Winter Court's might. When we meet Talera at the edge of an ancient ruin, she confides in the player that she knows that she will die while trying to claim the legendary artifact far within its depths, but she still feels a need to try anyways for the sake of her brethren that remain in the east. So together you find a way through the barrier and eventually find a spear of piercing light where you will fight off several waves of Niskaru while she claims her solution to the war. And that concludes all of the main story quests found in the Northern Plains and the Southern Barrens. Sure, you might have to run around a couple of zones just to activate a couple of windstones before the ancient ruin door will open, but both of these story sections feel significantly stripped down for time. So now we're in an interesting situation since the nine year long siege of Mel Senshir was only ever prophesized to end when the legendary spear was recovered despite the fact that the General Talera was always supposed to fail to recover the artifact. So that feels like a bit of an awkward situation, which means that we either just sped up the process of events, or there exist destinies that seem to contradict the laws of fate, which just doesn't seem like something that's supposed to happen. Regardless, things pick up pretty quickly as we sail to the New World, fight off a conveniently timed assault by the Tuatha, watch General Talera kind of just fail a couple of times before dying, then the player character mops up the entire situation by killing off the Tuatha commander as well as his giant Niskaru demon prince. I'm glossing over this section because sure this is a big set piece moment, but from a narrative standpoint, it just feels like a little bit of a letdown since the player is the only real harbinger of change to the entire situation. Why did I have to bother to recover this ancient magical spear? So that Talera could blast off this random minion from the back of a much more threatening enemy in the entire situation? And while fighting off the mighty Baylor creature seems like it should be a big deal, the fact that its attacks are so slow and choreographed make it feel like a chore as I whittle away at their health bar every chance I could get for just a couple minutes on end. All that's left to do is to gain the trust of a couple of Winter Fae that will bring us to the second Well of Souls where we used to work as an accomplice for the scientist Ventrinio. This means we do a tour through the swamps to destroy several chapels of the Winter King Gadflo before making our way to a forgotten island off the coast filled with zombies. Apparently something about the magical disturbance you caused by killing the Baylor is also causing the Well of Souls here to self-destruct and we get to have a bit of a reunion with our old employers after escaping the area. It turns out that you and Ventrinio were actually good friends while working together, and the last he had heard from you was when the Fateless One went on an expedition into the Winter Fey capital. So now that the two of you have been reunited, Ventrinio hands you the key to defeat the invulnerable guardian to the deeper Tuatha territories, and we make our way into the final stretch of the game. Would you guess that we're already nearly at the end of the main plotline already? You end up murdering your way through the House of Pride where the remaining Winter Fae that aren't mind controlled by Prismere bend the knee to your strength. Then you do the same thing as you fight your way through the southern mountains towards the Winter Throne. I can't even spice this up because it is as simple as you running from one end of the biome to the other without any real key tasks remaining to separate you from the enemy. In addition to that, I can't even call the combat during this section particularly interesting as they just throw pack after pack of Tuatha at the player with the same exact traditional melee, ranged, and magical enemy behaviors that we've been fighting against for the last 20 hours. Regardless, there are a couple of interesting moments as we put down the corrupted heads of the House of Pride and Vengeance along the way to our final prey. 
It's only at this final moment in the story that Alan Shearer catches up to the player and mentions the fact that the two of you used to work together before you died here the first time. Your strength was a result of many years in service to this secret agency that exists to protect the world from an ancient creature called Tyrannoch. Up until this point, the player might have picked up on the fact that the Tuatha Fey worship a god that they refer to as Tyrnok, but this is the first time that it's revealed that the creature is actually a flesh and blood organism of the world. Regardless, as a member of this ancient order, the reason why you died the first time was actually a result of an attempt to lock the creature up once again. You were always fated to die on that day, but something about the battle you undertook charged your body with the magic that just so happened to react to the well of souls that Hughes had built up half the world away. Still, with this upcoming fight against Gavflow coming up, Sheer knows that you're going to end up finding Tyrnok somewhere under the throne room, where you just so happen to be the only one that can really hope to seal her back up into the eternal prison. Of course, Alan Shear being the way that she is, she also threatens to kill you and everyone else you know if you ever tell the outside world about the existence of Tyrnok, since we've already seen what can happen if this entity really gets its claws into the mortal realms. What follows is a handful of battles that culminate with a fight against Gavlo, who happens to be one of the few bosses in the game to introduce different mechanics compared to normal enemies you fight. So at least that's somewhat interesting for the final boss fight. Up until the moment you find out that it was just a fight against a mirror image of the man, which always strikes me as a faux pas when designing key combat encounters. We then make our way up to the final chambers behind the throne and watch the real Gavlo get eaten by his boss before a near repeat of the Baylor fight from the siege set piece. Trigger an epic quick time event, fall into a never ending hole with the giant dragon god, and play the end credits. It pulls up a bunch of tropes that could be interesting, like a last minute secret order that protects the world and a being of pure evil that makes the original villain look like a joke, but yet again the plotline fails to make good on these hooks. A bit of this might be a result of me playing through the game for a second time, but I also remember feeling like the story was incredibly rushed even the first time I played through it all. For instance, the second half of the game feels much more condensed in terms of both landmass as well as quest density, which can almost feel like it's forcing the player into beelining the last couple stages of the game. But instead of just going with my gut feeling on the matter, I had a chance to look up my gameplay recordings and actually figure out how much time was spent in each biome, and the results were fairly surprising. If you want to see the detailed stats for each biome, you can look at the chart I have on the screen right now, but it's a pretty noticeable downward trend in game time spent in each area as you approach the endgame. But this is also perhaps foreshadowed by the number of zones present in each of those areas, with 10 forest zones, 6 desert zones, 10 plains zones, 7 swamp zones, and 5 prismere zones to round things out. We also go from having at least one quest hub for each 3 to 5 major quests in each zone towards the beginning of the game, to some scattered remnants of the resistance that might give you 1 to 2 major quests per zone on the second continent. The thing is, I can't necessarily consider this an inherently bad thing, since a lack of side quests can help focus the player on a period of the main quest which is supposed to be geared around this final assault on the Tuatha homelands. It lends the second continent a sense of timeliness to it all, as the scope of the world narrows down heavily into a conflict between humans and Tuatha, even to the point where the final biome ends up feeling like a single corridor of near constant fighting as we get closer and closer to the Winter Throne. Artistically, I think that's a really interesting thematic effect for the final couple hours of the campaign, but as a player? It just as easily gives off the vibes of an unfinished product, to suddenly go from almost over-designed MMO style zones to an entire biome modeled after a single mountain valley with several side dungeons that have almost no narrative reason for existing. Regardless of whether this change was intentional or not, the effect is just a little too jarring from my end. But that's kind of Ambler's big thing though, isn't it? 
They try to do a lot of cool things with their story and lore, but when you take things at face value, it just kind of comes off as trite and boring. It's only when I really start to peel back the layers of why we are doing the things we are doing that it suddenly turns the plot on its head and gives substance to the entire experience. And this ending is certainly no different in that regard. Take for example the fact that Gadflow, the current king of the Winter Fey, used to be their court jester and we can uncover that backstory just a little bit more by working our way through the lore stones surrounding the final area of the game. It turns out that he was well liked by the court before he arose to power, until one day no one laughed or smiled or batted an eyelid at the jester's antics. He juggled and sang and imitated the king to no avail for no one was left alive to behold the lone jester as he rose the crown above his head. Unshackled from his fate and aided by a mysterious magical power, the jester had turned the tides of what was meant to be, hell-bent on sending the remaining winter fey down a laughable path of madness. These lords and heroes would of course rise again in due time to challenge the rogue jester until spikes of prismere burst from the land to impale anyone who would dare to challenge the young king, and the heroes of the land stopped coming back with time. Faced with the loss of their immortality, the remaining Winter Fey bent the knee and were formally renamed as Tuatha Dayon, forced to salt the earth and corrupt their homeland so thoroughly that the Winter Court eventually came to resemble the opposite of the Summer Court, instead of the sister organization it had always meant to be up until this point. And so it was that the Jester King brought the immortal race to its knees and started a Grand Crusade towards the true madness that he had always held deep within his heart. Now that is an interesting story. It's there, hidden in a bunch of books and text and audio logs that take the form of floating stones only waiting to be ingested into the player's subconscious. But it's this missable quality to the exploration of this whole organization that leaves them as little more than a radical sect of winter fey who always seem to hate the mortal races for some unknown reason. Take for example the prior role of the Tuatha King as the last court's jester, which almost single-handedly brings a whole nother level of nuance to the entire situation, but very few people are going to even care enough to look into things to notice that small fact. Perhaps after being forced to play the role of the fool, laughed at and misused for literally thousands of years since the dawn of life itself, he finally decided to fight back against his fate that was written for him. Similar to the Witch of Windermere, this poor soul that was enslaved to his role, except that unlike the Witch of Thorns, he was never respected as a proper nemesis to the House of Summer Fae. No, he was the whipping boy, but for his own family of the Winter Court, to be laughed at and chided for doing nothing more than picking the short straw in the cosmic lottery, and he rebelled against that fate, as I think most would after enough time. By stripping the old heroes of their immortality, Gadflow elevated the Tuatha masses to a higher level in the Fey hierarchy, no longer forced to be the dregs and servants of their society, Anyone who followed Gadflow into war was given a chance to become something of their own making instead of the fate prescribed for them by pure chance. Indeed, the power of self-control and power over their own goals in life was so great that the Tuatha Crusade was destined to succeed had it not been for the Fateless One coming along to save the day. But of course, none of this could be possible to begin with if it hadn't been for the hidden support of Tirnok. Now, when we finally get to meet Tirnok in person, at the closing moments of the game, they are represented to us as a dragon, just like any other fantasy mega evil, except that using this game's lore system, Tirnok is technically a type of fey. With the foreknowledge that many fey come in non-humanoid forms, it seems like this imprisoned god takes the form of a dragon in order to demonstrate the sheer metaphysical power of the creature to the world order since this creature also maintains the ability to talk with others as though it is using telepathy. But what's really interesting about the dragon is the fact that Tirnok seems tied to the very nature of fate itself, 
due to its ability as one of the only entities that can truly seem to alter the way that fate affects this world. This is even further stressed after the end credits when we wake up from a bed in Rathir, and Agarth congratulates us on a job well done. If you pick some of the alternate dialogue options in this post credits world, Agarth reveals to you that fate weaving doesn't really work like it used to, and now everyone appears to be fateless as a result of your battle with the dragon. So if we look a little bit deeper into the fandom, there's two main theories on exactly how Tyrnok played a role in the tapestry of fate. Their first explanation is the idea that fate is an inherent magical effect woven into the tapestry of all living creatures of this world, and Tyrnok was simply a source of so much magical energy that they were able to overpower the natural state of the world. So when the player defeated Tyrnok in battle, it released such an explosive amount of magical energy that it broke the fabric of the world and fate could no longer mend its holes. This idea could also be expressed by the ability that Tyrnok was also fated to win their war of destruction, and so by sealing them back away, the hero inadvertently changed the fate of every creature in the world at the same time, causing some level of caustic shock to the system that was so drastic that the weave could no longer repair itself. The other major argument made for Tyrnok's role in the fate of this world indicates that fate might just be an extension of the specific type of magic that Tyrnok is able to use. By this reasoning, fate would then be described as though it was a type of curse that the dragon released upon the world when it was first sealed away so many years ago. Or, on the other hand, it's possible that the world itself was using the sheer magical ability of Tyrnok to sustain such a fate system, as though they were the power source behind the magic, like a super battery hidden beneath the winter court. All of which becomes even more interesting when we factor in the plan Tyrnok seems to have put in motion back when they killed you the first time around. Tyrnok is the real reason why you are the only corpse to have successfully revived after going through the Well of Souls. The plan was always to set you on a path of violence back to the Old Fae, during which you could grow and absorb the experience of those individuals that you helped change the fate of. This would be why Gadflow was so obsessed with a random body that was carted halfway around the world before given any spark of life again, because he knew that you were meant to be his master's champion at the end of the day. The constant stream of assassins and spy networks created almost specifically to track your movements were like the eyes of Big Brother, always watching and always encouraging the player's growth with a steady flow of weak to Waltha subordinates to gradually develop your powers. So when the player finally reaches Tyrnok's final resting chamber, the dragon tries pulling out this accumulated power of fate from your body because they simply wanted to speed up the process of their escape from the eternal cell by using you as yet another smaller battery to draw from. Built to be the skeleton key to unlock any fate and restriction, you were both the one thing that could set Tyrnok free, as well as the one thing that could push them even deeper into the dark hole that they were trying to escape from. It's a fitting point of irony that the Master's greatest creation was also the only tool that could truly lead to their downfall, and a point which is going to pass most players by since the vast majority of this master plan is revealed through the actual boss mechanics of the final fight. Unfortunately, what we actually got to see through the ending cinematics was an awfully predictable character death for Gadflow that was more of a letdown than a grand finale for the main villain that we have been interacting with for the last two continents and the fact that the final boss of the game feels less like a genuine challenge to the player and more like a gimmick style boss battle felt like an incredibly poor design choice considering the combat mechanics behind this game were probably its greatest draw to many of the players who prefer the action economy design of it all. As such, the conclusion to this main storyline follows the same exact mistakes that we've seen from every other faction questline up until this point. A genuine lack of the time and care required to build up the character and emotional attachment needed to give players the same gravitas that I feel about the lore. It's just so 
intensely frustrating to me that it seems like they have built up all this rationale set up for some truly interesting plot lines but then they just left the structure to rot under the weight of repetitive combat, dungeons, and quest design, which leads me all back to my original point about the game. If you want to play through Kingdoms of Amalur, you're probably going to want to do so for the lore, since everything else is just so strikingly average. Thankfully, with the handful of DLC packs released for the game, it seems like the developers learned from their mistakes while designing these 2-3 to three hour expansions to the world. The first DLC for Amalur arrived on March 20th, 2012, and was named The Legend of Dead Kel after the main antagonist for the short story of this abandoned island. The DLC has a light pirate theme to it all as the merchant skills request your help taking care of the dread pirate Dead Kel that's been sinking any ships that pass by his island. Along the way, you join up with a Captain Bradigan as a freak storm ends up leaving you shipwrecked along those long lost shores. With time, you'll have the chance to explore a small village of humans that have developed a home on this island and are protected from the anger of Dead Kel by the blessings of their god, Akara. The next handful of quests will have you helping out the villagers save some citizens that went missing when they left the safety of the Forbiddens, until you eventually find a way to steal back a decent sized ship from Dead Kel. Now that you and the other castaways have a safe way off the island, Dead Kel takes his chances by sending a spy to infiltrate the villagers' religious ceremony and cut off the support from their god. After you manage to track down the infiltrator to the back of a cave, you're forced to put down both the religious figurehead as well as the undead witch that was possessing her body. Unfortunately, now that the next scion of the god, Akara, has fallen in the process, it now falls upon you, as the most able-bodied individual left on the island, to take up the mantle of champion and protect the castaways. The ceremony to gain their god's blessing takes place at a small shrine at the top of the island's highest mountain, and your location for the final battle with the legendary dead Kel. Once there, the hero is imbued with a strange red energy that infuriates Kel, who claimed it was his birthright, not yours, and reveals a secret entrance deeper into the temple that lies below this island. It's only at the deepest point of Dead Kel's underground dungeon that we find a world tree, one of the twelve great branches that form the Ring of Kozai and some of the oldest living creatures in the entire land. It's only here at the final moments of the DLC that we get to really have a decent talk with Dead Kel, whom we find out was actually revived by the world tree named Akara. Several hundred years ago, the dying body of Kel washed up on the shores of this island and the great tree took pity on his soul. In the process of trying to keep the young warrior alive, Akara left dead Kel somewhere in between life and death. Not quite as brain dead as the other skeletons we fight on our journeys, but also not entirely still a human, as it seemed to happen for the Fateless One. Kel was left on the in-between of life and death, tethered to a never-ending nightmare, as the power of Akara bound him just as close to the uncharted island as it did to his fleeting sense of mortality. So now that we finally get to learn about Kel's motives, it turns out that he's been killing off the humans that visit this island in the hope that he might be able to steal the power of the Scion out from under the villagers. If he had even that small amount of additional power from the World Tree, Kel might finally be able to kill his jailer and escape from his time on Earth, taking the tree with him into the afterlife. And what's funny about this whole situation is that Akara seems to agree with this sentiment. After all, the tree had only been meaning to restore life to a poor soul in need, yet failed to have the foresight that Kel might not be happy with the undead results of this godly resurrection. And while in most other RPGs this might have been a good moment for player choice, in Amalur the player is railroaded into killing off Dead Kel while also letting the god tree commit suicide out of sheer grief for the pain that he caused another creature. It is a fittingly tragic end to the DLC and I have to mention the fact that I genuinely enjoyed this final twist for the backstory behind Dead Kel, but 
in terms of gameplay, the DLC remains a repeat of everything that's come before it. The island is of course packed with a series of dungeons which always have either an objective or a boss at the end of them and match up one for one between each quest and location to explore. It's the same general breakup of things that feels normalized after going through all the initial zones of the game, but the one thing that hits different for this DLC is the way that they handle player housing. Up until this point, you will earn a couple of houses, a mine, and a military keep throughout the initial two continents, while the main thing that pulls them together is the presence of a player stash and character customization mirror in each of these locations. By visiting the mine every so often, you can pick up some passive income, and several of the houses can be upgraded for a small amount of money, but for the most part, I found the player housing to be a bit of an afterthought. It's not like you will really have a chance to decorate these buildings in any way, nor do any of your options pull together all of the workshop benches you would want for the full crafting experience. So the only reason I used these buildings was to access the stash at a couple of points for the most part. That being said, I still think there's a real value to giving the player access to a place that they can call their own, and every time I got access to another building I would immediately invest all the cash they needed to upgrade the place to its highest level, regardless of whether I would ever really use the place. So when the Legend of Dead Kel DLC not only added a more fleshed out player housing area, but also used it to make the player a lord of the surrounding territory, I just know this is something that will resonate with a lot of players. The process of renovating the actual building begins as an elimination quest to first defeat all the animals that had taken over the keep for the last hundred years. Then you'll have to wander around the island picking up specific bits of debris and resources in order to help your gnomish friend really build things up to your lordly standards. Along the way, you'll also unlock an animal handler that you can bring food to in order to domesticate some of the animals in the area. Or you can spend time in a mini arena time challenge thing fighting off the fauna to see if you can beat your weapons master's best time on each of the encounters. Otherwise, the rest of the renovations are going to unlock a series of merchants and political advisors that can help you run this new fledgling nation. So before you get your hopes up, this isn't going to be an in-depth regent system like in Pathfinder Kingmaker, and frankly it's not even as in-depth as the Fable 3 King section, but you can tell that they at least tried. You can send off envoys to the surrounding nations in order to try and invest gold into passive income trade deals, or you can send spies to infiltrate your neighbors to give you better options and know-how on the world stage. But mostly, becoming a lord involves sitting down at the throne so that you can hear requests from a couple of people on the island that ask for help, which usually involves a quick side quest down into the surrounding dungeons. At first I thought this might be how Amler would develop a radiant quest system, but in reality there's only a list of 10 quests for you to do in this manner before the requesters wear themselves out. All in all, it was a cute little distraction that doesn't have a lot of substance behind the systems or rule for the game, but at the same time, I'm happy that they at least tried. There's very few games that put in even the small effort to make you feel like a local ruler like this game does, and I think that's a bit of a fantasy for many longtime RPG fans. So while I was kind of disappointed with the amount of effort put into the system as a whole, this was definitely one of the highlights over the entire DLC, since it certainly does give you a different type of thematic feeling when you're developing something for yourself instead of a random quest giver for once in the entire game. Other than that, the rest of the DLC left me feeling like it was an extension of the exact same type of stories that I had been seeing over and over from the original continents of Amler. The main through line about Dead Kel accomplishes more with its lore background than it ever does in the actual events that take place. Just like how many of the side attractions around the island end up amounting to little more than names to tick off the list. But considering the fact it comes prepackaged with the new Re-Reckoning release, there's worse ways to spend your time than exploring the 2-5 hours it takes to make your way through the DLC. As for the next DLC, named after the Teeth of Naros, it seems to me like the developers behind Amler finally started to learn how to develop a decent emotional connection with the characters in their world. 
We start the DLC by making our way on an expedition through the southern mountains in search of an ancient civilization that hasn't been heard from in recent memory. Along the way, most of your companions are killed off by the many traps and creatures found in the tunnels, leaving you alone as we confront this strange talking head that claims to be a god. She asks for your help restoring the people in the nearby valley to their rightful path, and we suddenly have our mission for the area. It turns out that this valley is actually the home to a strange stone-like race called the Colossi, which immediately struck me as a grand addition to the already established sentient creatures of this world. Our first contact with the race takes the form of their captain of the guard, Sikandra, and you immediately join their ranks to try and deal with the aggressive push from the nearby Jotun. By fighting your way up the mountain and taking care of the Jotun commander, we earn the trust of the Colossi, who take our appearance to be a herald from their god. Of course, Sikandra immediately takes you to their capital city that floats high above the clouds with the use of some strange godly magic. The Colossi culture is obviously inspired by the ancient Greeks, as can be seen from their focus on marble architecture, as well as their interest in both debates and playwrights, all of which helps us immediately understand their sense of value in a pantheon of gods for which you've just become the harbinger. More specifically, when we first met one of their gods, we were given the direction to seek out the Primos, who happens to be the religious leader for this race. You'll quickly learn that the floating city was never truly completed, as for some reason their race lost the favor of the gods halfway through its construction. The next couple quests give you a chance to explore the zone as you search for the golden bracelets from their last leader, hidden deep within the sewers of their city, then obtaining a couple feathers from the Queen Cuckoo at the top of the eastern mountains. But more importantly, during these tasks you'll actually be joined by the main characters for the DLC in the form of Sikandra and their newest religious leader named Anakados. This is a surprisingly big deal for Amler, since this actually gives these characters a chance to talk with you just a little bit more than you would regularly see from a quest giver. We learn that Sikandra was in love with the previous leader for their people, and those golden bangles are the only thing they were able to find left of him after the gods smote him down for trying to take their power into his own hands. Or how we get to experience the willingness for Anacados to get his hands dirty if he really needs to in order to do what he thinks is best for his people, fighting off the nearby wildlife for the tools you need for our next ritual. After we get to know just a little bit more about these characters, we're finally ready to move the plot forward and repair the broken city. That is, until Anacados betrays us halfway through the process and takes the power for himself. It's an interesting setup for a dungeon considering the fact that you basically walk to the end of it before the plot twist happens and suddenly all of the guardians that you saw on the way down become hostile as you're forced to fight your way out with Sikandra. Now that we're back out on the surface, our first stop is going to be the holy place for the Colossi race that Anakado seems to be keeping under strangely strict control, perhaps as a way to hide a clue to his plans. So as we battle our way deep into the forgotten depths and past the corpses of the Primus' many political victims over the years, the player will eventually find his way to a lone prisoner named Arches, the previous Primus of the Colossi. It turns out that the reason why the bracelets were the only item they could find from RK's failure was because he had never died in the first place, instead being kept right under the nose of the people he was supposed to defend from religious radicals like the cult of Anakados. So now that he's finally been discovered all these years later, it's only fitting that the man gets to die right in front of his long lost lover, Sikandra, as this tortured husk gives you the last couple clues you need to defeat Anakados. This is some Greek tragedy level stuff as we learn that it was actually Anakados who first encouraged Primus Arches to try and finish the city sooner than the gods wanted it to happen, causing the stony race to fall from their favor. But now it falls upon the two of you to try and recover the blessings of earth and air in order to finally confront the corrupted Primus and take back control over this people's future. 
the dungeons themselves are surprisingly well put together as you pick up a handful of blessings scattered around the air temple that will allow you to walk across an invisible corridor to the final room, or how in the earth temple you will have to follow the small will-o'-wisps through the dark corridors as the many monsters in the area try to mount a surprise attack on you. Some of the few points in the entire game that the map layer asks a player to do something more involved than simply run to the end of a circular dungeon design. So it is that we can finally return to the fallen city Nexus and confront Anakados for his crimes in a grand boss battle that actually adds in a new combat mechanic compared to anything we've seen in the past. Even if you activate the fate mode that usually lets you kill any boss in the game up until this point, you'll only be able to take off a third of his health with the ability since the fight is broken up into three phases as he calls in several cultists to help him out in between each intermission. But as soon as you defeat the false primus, the nexus starts to rise into the city proper and the player must make one final dash through the underground temple as the area starts to fall apart. Upon returning to the city, the Nexus has finally found its place in the central square for their civilization, and Sikandra is promptly named the new Primus as she guides her people into the next era. Now, I have to say that this was a really good DLC, because for once in the entirety of my time with Amalur, I felt invested in the actual characters in addition to the background lore. It's not only a worthwhile story because of the existence of this strange stony race that's interesting to learn about, but the actual people that made up this small section of gameplay actually feel believable in a way that helps elevate the plot points that are thrown out over the course of a couple hours. Sure, the vast majority of the objectives and quests are still fetch and kill scenarios, but when we phrase those tasks in the context of emotional development that I actually care about, everything just gets an order of magnitude more worthwhile in my own estimation. Now, a part of this is caused by the way that we seem to attach the entire story to the two main characters between Sikandra and Anakados, but it also forms in the little things like getting the chance to hear out Sikandra's side of the story as we go steal from the tomb of her dead lover. But then you also get the emotional whiplash from a well-timed plot twist as we learn that the man she loved had never died in the first place. So now that we're dealing with a story comprised of flawed characters who each seem to have their own goals and schemes, there's actually a sense of motivation to see where the questline takes us. And while it's not on the same level of moral grey as Game of Thrones, it's still objectively a step up from the simple morality of good versus evil that we've been dealing with for almost the entire game up until this point. Which unfortunately highlights the lack of investment I have been able to develop for anything else up until this point in time. The Teeth of Naros proves that Kingdoms of Amler can do storytelling right or at the very least present their story in a much more interesting way than we get to see in the base game. So that means, at least on some level, the developers for their original game either didn't have the time to put in the same amount of effort into a more motivating main quest, or perhaps they purposely wanted the faction quests to seem like children's fables by their own design. So here's the point where everything kind of clicked in my head, and suddenly Amalur start to feel like an extension of the Fable series of game design. It allows you to play as a character with almost no established backstory, while a mentor character tells you about the fate of the world and what you have to do to stop the upcoming calamity. You can mix and match between the three types of combat with strength, skill, and will, without ever limiting your ability to progress if you choose to be a jack of all trades. There's player housing and the ability to kill any character in the game if they look at you the wrong way, all tied together with a simple artistic charm that focuses on simplicity instead of realism. And while both games try to spice things up with a handful of moral choices sprinkled throughout the game, for the most part those choices are so unimportant that they might as well not exist considering the general lack of divergent gameplay. This is a reductive way to look at both of the games, since I could just as easily point out all the ways that they are different from one another, like the Fable games focus on collectibles and family life, but that doesn't stop the games from feeling like estranged siblings from the same family, maybe separated at birth, but undeniably related to one another if you put them in the same room. And a great reason for this is the general theme of both games, 
the mouthfeel, if you will, that is the accumulation of every story and gameplay feature lumped together. So in the case of Kingdoms of Amalur, that grand accumulation of the overall intentions behind the game strikes me like a look through our ancient mythology, with stories of good and evil, black and white, morality and debasement, and all the ethical lessons that come with them as a result. Because on its face, Amler is a strikingly basic game to play through. It wears its heart on its sleeve with a couple of interesting stories of betrayal and secrets, but always presented to the player in the most straightforward way possible. But when the player has already made their way through a good handful of fantasy style RPGs before, it instead asks the player to look beneath the surface and think about why these things are happening the way that they are. The one thing that Amler seems to do better than most other games is by developing an interesting world to learn about, and then using that unique set of rules to develop questlines and philosophies that you're not really going to find in any other type of setting. But I also think that most people aren't going to go deep enough on this game to ever get to that point in the first place, since the vast majority of the moral ambiguity is hidden under layers upon layers of straightforward quests and filler content. Even for me, the first time I played through the game back in 2012 was a fairly boring experience, and I don't think I would have enjoyed this second trip half as much if I wasn't also analyzing it from a more critical perspective than your average gamer is ever going to put into a game. All of which is backed up by a rather lukewarm reception that marks Ambler as a 7 out of 10 game on a good day and a 6 out of 10 game for the more jaded RPG fan. For the most part, I found Kingdoms of Ambler to be absolutely average in almost every single way. This just isn't the type of game that I'm going to go out and tell people that they have to pick it up, but I think any game that has enough depth to it that I can talk for more than two hours probably has something worth a look at if you've already played through most of the other good games in the genre. And as for the re-release of the game with a couple of mild accessibility improvements, if you've already played through Amalur before Re-Reckoning, you're not going to find anything new here worth coming back for. And now that it's been almost an entire year from the release date, and we still haven't even seen the slightest bit of information about the supposed DLC that's supposed to be coming out in 2021, and I'm not really feeling optimistic about the future additions to the series. At best, it might be a 3-5 to five hour long standalone experience tacked on to the end of your playthrough, and that just honestly isn't going to be enough for me to say that it's worth coming back to work your way through all the fluff that makes up the vast majority of this game. So while it might be worthwhile for the most avid fans of the series, the fact that they don't even have something worth showing off yet for this DLC gives me the distinct impression that whatever comes in the future is going to resemble the DLCs that have already come out for the game. It's like ordering a large fry when you already know damn well you're probably only hungry for a medium. And that's okay. I think it's great when a developer goes back to add on to games long after they were in their prime, mostly out of a sense of creative interest in their old projects. But in the case of Re-Reckoning, even the initial remaster felt like a cash grab as the newest publisher to hold the IP try their best to find a way to monetize an old project. And that's just not the type of behavior that I find worthwhile. I don't really want to end the video on a low point like this, but with the Amler series basically over as we know it after the failure to launch their MMO, this is kind of the solemn state that we're stuck in. And while the final DLC of Teef of Naro showed their promise for what the developers might have done in the future, I don't really think we're ever going to see that future come to life anytime soon. And that's the real shame when you build a game that screams prequel energy quite like Kingdoms of Amalur, always threatening to become a great and powerful entry to the video game hall of fame, but never quite catching up to the series it was always trying to imitate. And that's where I have to leave you off today, with a sad taste of disappointment in my mouth for what I feel like this series could have become over time if it ever had the chance. <laughs> 
So if you'd like to join me on any similar videos and close critique of video games, check out my channel where I've done quite a few projects on similar games like the Dragon Age series and the Fable series. If you like what I'm putting out, feel free to click the subscribe button to tell me that I'm doing a good job, or you can always comment below to let me know exactly how I ruined your day. But of course, before I leave, I'd like to shout out a couple of other YouTube channels that you should check out for more content about the subject like Lore Runner, who did an absolutely amazing lore analysis for Kingdoms of Amler that any fan of the game should totally check out, and I basically had to base a lot of what I said about the lore on his really in-depth analysis for it all. Or, if you haven't already heard about Kbash, I ended up really enjoying his review for Re-Reckoning. Otherwise, I hope you have a fantastic day, week, or month until we have a chance to meet again. Thanks for watching. Instead, I would argue that Amul- Instead, I would argue lur- <laughs> Instead, after a round and- Instead, after around an hour of testing- Instead, after around an hour of- Or how the warrior ability line has several improved health, passive, and- has several improved health paths interrupting their attack and stopping them from moving long enough for the next hit in like when i can see an attack coming but it's from the chakra combo from the chakra combo but that's also going to cost 280 mana along <laughs> you know simply based on how common physical and elemental the Summer Fae embody courage, memory, and harmony. There we find a corpse of one of the monks who had been material for armor and weapons instead of a hallucin hallucinogenic aim for at the beginning of this journey, and he willingly guides you. As such, you'll most likely be picking up your quests throughout the faction from the many defensive keeps powers that form the crown of Kamazandru and Kam Kamazandu Kamazandu and grand manifestation of our true power we end we instead meet in essence this in essence in essence in essence this become magical entity known as Ciara S in addition to that, there were several quip in the grand city of Isa. Of Isa. In the grand city of Isa. As well as his giant Niskaru demon prince. I'm glossing over. Take for example the fact that Gadflo, the current king of the Winter Flay, chance to become something of their own making instead of the fate prescribed for them by pure chance. That the Tuatha Crusade was destined to sus <coughs> This would be why Gadflow was so obsessed. Along the way, you join up with a captain named. In the process of trying to keep the young war warrior alive, the main through line about Dead Kel. Uh, then obtaining a couple of feathers from a Queen Kaku at the then obtaining a couple of feathers from the Queen Kaku. I think any game that has enough depth to it, that has enough, that has enough depth on his really in-depth analysis for it all, analysis for all, analysis for it all. 